Okay, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. So we're going to finish talking about diabetes, talking primarily about insulin resistance. And so when we look at all of the complications of diabetic treatment, uh, whether it's insulin-induced hypoglycemia, uh, poor glucose control, uh, or insulin resistance, probably the most common thing that we see clinically is uh, insulin resistance. So we're going to focus on that. Again, if you have questions, that's my email address. Uh, and again, the notes uh, are all going to be uh, at that website, veterinarydiagnosticinvestigation.com. Now, the nice thing, I think, too, about working up insulin resistance is that there's lots of good things that can cause it. So it's an interesting disorder to try and approach both in the dog and the cat. And I think over the last few years, sort of, there's been somewhat of a change in what the definition of resistance means. And I think as a result of that, uh, we found um, new things that are resulting in resistance that I think are clinically important. It used to be we defined resistance simply as a maximal dose of insulin that if you exceeded that that under, uh, became the definition. And certainly that's still present. So I think if you're using more than one and a half units per kilogram of insulin twice a day for a dog or a cat, um, that's too much. And so at that point, you should be looking and going, there's something that's going on that's either interfering with the action of the insulin or there's a systemic disorder going on that's uh, promoting hyperglycemia and or affecting uh, the dose of the insulin. So greater than one and a half units per kilogram of insulin twice a day. Uh, blood glucose is that stay persistently elevated during a VG curve. Uh, by elevated, I mean greater than 300. Another uh, definition of resistance is that you have glycemic control that's erratic and insulin requirements seem to fluctuate. So you have animals who seem well controlled one month at a given dose of insulin, uh, but then the next month they're requiring higher doses and the next month they're requiring lower doses. The thing with most diabetic dogs especially is that usually once they become diabetic, they stay diabetic and their insulin requirement doesn't change a whole lot. So when you're seeing rapid um, and consistent fluctuations in insulin dose, then that's probably an indication that there's something going on uh, that again is either promoting hyperglycemia or resulting uh, in insulin resistance. And what we basically do is divide insulin resistance into two categories. One is it's a problem related to the insulin treatment or it's a problem related to a concurrent illness that's going on uh, with that patient. Things that we see that result from insulin therapy are problems such as the insulin is no longer active. So it's past its expiration date. Um, that's either on the bottle or um, that we know, for instance, with glargine insulin, if it's refrigerated, it's good for six months. Um, so if we're seeing inactive insulin products or outdated insulin products, the easiest thing to do is just to switch to a new bottle. Um, we don't like to use diluted insulin anymore um, because, again, when you dilute insulin, you're diluting out everything. Um, you're diluting out the pH, you're diluting out the protamine, the zinc, um, you're diluting out the ingredients that actually make it uh, the behave as that type of insulin. The owners may not be giving it properly. Now, one of the things we like to do is that uh, when we have an animal where we're having what seems to be resistance, we'll give the owner a sterile bottle of diluent and an insulin syringe, and we'll say, okay, show us what you do every day. And then what I would do is record it, uh, because the, the stuff they do is just mind-blowing. Um, so what we do know is that uh, topical insulin does not work uh, very well. You know, insulin shot into the eye, into the ear, generally not very effective. Um, we had a cat. I, I had a cat and a cat owner, and the cat owner seemed relatively normal, which was odd. Um, we diagnosed the cat with diabetes, sent the cat home uh, on uh, two units of Glargine twice a day, said, you know, she said, there's no way I can measure blood glucose as I can't do that. And, we quickly came to the determination she probably could not do it. So I said, just bring your cat back in a week, and we'll do it here and see what's going on. We gave her written instructions. Uh, Renee, my assistant, showed her how to give the insulin, draw it up. It made you want to cry how effective it was. Sent the cat home, scheduled an appointment for a week. She's a no-show. Oh, that's not so surprising. <coughs> Call her and say, hey, you should bring the cat in. She goes, oh, the cat's actually doing okay. I'm going to come next week. Next week, she brings the cat in. Cat's in the exam room, on the exam table. I walk in. The cat is laterally recumbent. I mean, barely breathing. Um, I see his chest wall move sporadically. And, I, I, and the cat looks like it's lost 99% you know, of its body weight. So I walk in, I say, hey, how's it going? She goes, that's a really good question. She goes, it sort of goes like this. 
In the morning, the cat is running around the house. It's ravenous. It's pawing my kids for food. It's jumping around on the table. I feed it, give it its insulin. And then middle of the morning, the cat's like really tired, really lethargic, crawling underneath things like he wants to die. And then we repeat the process in the evening. He kind of comes out of it. He seems okay. He's hungry. I feed him. I give him insulin. He wants to crawl away and die again. And I said, and what part of this did you think was okay? You know, because that's not exactly our goal here. And she goes, yeah, I know. It just seemed weird. We were coming to see you anyway. I said, okay. I said, here's a bottle of diluent. And I gave her an insulin syringe. And she looks at me and, and she goes, well, I need, I need two syringes. And I said, of course you do. Now, when I was a younger vet, that kind of stuff <laughs> used to bother me. Like I would immediately start going, oh, my God, you know, what the hell? Now I just say, really, seriously? Okay, I want to see this. So I gave her two insulin syringes. She draws them both up, promptly gives her cats two cc's of sub-Q fluid. And I said, what in God's name are you doing? And she goes, I'm giving the cat insulin. I go, so this is how much insulin you've been giving your cat every day? Twice a day? 200 units of insulin. She said, well, that's what you told me to do. And so she had decided that despite what we had showed her and told her and written for her, that one cc and one unit were the same. So what the hell? So she'd been giving her cat 200 units of insulin twice a day. So we took the cat, took it into the back. It had a blood glucose of minus 47. <laughs> Went back in, had the whole discussion again about, you know, this is not good. Eventually we got the cat fixed and, and it was figured out. But never assume that when they tell you that they know what they're doing, that they have any idea of what they're doing. <coughs> Insulin resistance may just be that we're not actually giving it enough. So it could be that for that particular animal, there's really no underlying metabolic disorder. There's no underlying issue with respect to the insulin product. That, that animal just needs more insulin, so maybe it's a dose problem. Insulin resistance can also be secondary to a Samoji. So the animal actually goes hypoglycemic from the insulin, gets a rebound hyperglycemia, and so your assessment is that the glucoses are too high and you need to raise the dose when, in fact, the glucose is too low and we need to lower the dose. And the only way we can sort that out is by doing a curve with enough glucose that we can document the drop uh, followed by the rebound hyperglycemia. Some animals, as we mentioned earlier, could have inadequate frequency of administration. There are some dogs and some cats that actually probably would do better with TID insulin. So that may not be a resistant state. By definition, it's not resistant. The duration of action is short. Um, and so what we would have to do, again, is curve them, show that they actually need to take uh, either an intermediate acting insulin three times a day or a combination of a long acting uh, and a short acting insulin. There are animals and people that have impaired insulin absorption. Um, for whatever reason, some humans have insulinase, an enzyme present in their subcutaneous tissue. We don't know what it's doing there, uh, but whenever they take insulin, the insulinase degrades their insulin. Don't know if that happens in dogs or cats. Most impaired insulin absorption is due to uh, incorrect administration. So they're either giving it intradermally or, as we mentioned, if they keep giving it repeatedly in the same site, uh, they may result in decreased absorption. Anti-insulin antibodies may be a factor, especially in a dog if they're using uh, non-porcine-derived insulin, but it seems to be a very uncommon complication in terms of clinical resistance in either dogs or cats. And then whenever we have absolutely no idea what's going on, we just say, I don't know, it's an act of God, you just, we're going to have to figure it out or we just keep raising the dose of insulin. What are more interesting, though, are disease states that are commonly associated with insulin resistance. So we're going to go through the list of disease states as a group, then we'll go through them individually and talk about them in order uh, of their frequency. Uh, one is, is the animal on a drug that's uh, diabetogenic? So is it on a glucocorticoid? Is it on a progestin uh, that may be causing that animal to uh, have insulin resistance? And if it is, then what can we do to get them off? If they're on it for allergic disease, can we switch them to something like cyclosporin? If they're on uh, prednisone for inflammatory bowel disease, can we switch them to something like budesonide, which will have less of a systemic absorption? If they're having an autoimmune endocrine or an autoimmune disease like polyarthritis or hemolytic anemia, and they're on high doses of glucocorticoids, can we add something else to it like cyclosporin or mycophenolate to try and treat that and try and wean them off of the glucocorticoid? If it's a dog or a cat with consistent clinical signs, does it have hyperdrenocorticism? If it's an intact female, is it in diasporas? So remember that intact females are going to be hormonally pregnant for 62 days. And during that time, 
Um, they're going to have very high levels of progesterone, which stimulate the release of growth hormone, uh, which cause insulin antagonism. We do see growth hormone problems in the cat, but not as a result of diasterous, but as a result of acromegaly. Uh, and we'll talk about acromegaly in cats uh, later on, because this is probably the number one cause uh, of insulin resistance that we see right now in the cat. Infections, and they don't have to be sepsis. This could be simple infections, bad oral cavity disease, uh, pyodermas, urinary tract infections, whether they're symptomatic or not, uh, can result in insulin resistance. So we want to go ahead and address those. Both hypothyroidism in dogs and hyperthyroidism in cats uh, can cause insulin resistant states. Uh, and so we'll talk about uh, addressing those. Renal disease, hepatic disease, primarily because of its effects on insulin clearance and insulin metabolism uh, can result in resistance. Heart disease, probably because of activation of uh, systemic uh, anti-inflammatory effects as well as counter-regulatory hormones uh, can cause resistance. Glucagon secreting pancreatic tumors are very rare in dogs, but when they do occur, cause two things insulin-resistant diabetes, and a very characteristic skin disorder um, where they start to slough their foot pads. Um, and so if we're seeing cutaneous disease in a diabetic um, that's having uh, insulin problems or glucose control problems, then we'll go ahead and look for uh, a glucagon-secreting pancreatic tumor. Other tumors that have been associated with uh, resistance in dogs are pheochromocytomas, uh, other diseases, IBD, pancreatitis, triaditis in cats, EPI, simple obesity uh, will do it. Hypertriglyceridemia will do it, uh, primarily because of its effects on antagonizing insulin. Uh, like we said, a variety of cancers. And then when nothing else works, we just say, yeah, we don't know. Um, we've worked your animal up and we're just going to keep giving it insulin. There is no dose of insulin that's too much. There is no such thing as a toxic dose of insulin. So while we're working these animals up for an underlying cause, we'll just continue to raise the dose of the insulin to get to whatever level we need to try and control uh, the PUPD. So when we're approaching them diagnostically, the animals with resistance, assuming that we've first gone back and ruled out any problem with insulin or insulin administration, um, we're going to be looking at, well, what's their BCS? Um, what degree of obesity do they have? If they are obese, what's our plan? Um, for dogs uh, and for cats. What medications are they on? Uh, when was the last heat cycle and when were they spayed? Sometimes, you know, owners, they don't know. You know, they're not sure they got it as a stray. Um, they're not sure what they're looking for. Are there any signs of infection, um, including urinary tract infections, that we should be looking at? On physical exam, we're going to be obviously doing the BCS score, whether you're doing it out of five or out of nine. Uh, rectal examinations looking for uh, concurrent disorders uh, like uh, anal sac tumors. We're going to be looking at thyroid evaluation both in dogs and cats. And basically you're just going to be doing a thorough physical because what we're trying to do is to decide where we're going to go diagnostically. Because the workup for resistance, we kind of want to do it in a fairly logical pattern because they could end up, we could end up running quite a few tests. So we want to end up sort of going in the order with which we think we're going to get the most information. So we usually are going to start just with screening, CBC, CAM, UA. We're going to automatically just culture the urine. Uh, as we talked about with Cushing, diabetic dogs, uh, oftentimes even though they can have a positive urine culture, may not have bacteria and pyuria on a UA. Um, so you want to go ahead and just routinely culture their urines and treat any infection that's present. If you're not sure about the sex hormone status or whether or not they have ovaries and whether or not they're in diestrous, uh, we can measure serum proge uh, progesterone level in the dog. Uh, anything greater than one indicates uh, luteal activity in the presence of a uh, functional ovary. We'll do chest radiographs and possibly an abdominal ultrasound because at that point we're looking for uh, any causes of, uh, we're looking for neoplasia or any systemic disease. Hormonally in dogs, we're going to be looking at a total T4 and a free T4 to diagnose hypo. And cats are going to be looking at a total T4 and a free T4 to diagnose hyper, and we'll talk about that uh, in more detail. If we're looking to rule out Cushing's in a dog or a cat, then we're going to do some type of adrenal function test, and we'll go through the specifics of that. And if we're looking for acromegaly, uh, currently in the United States, we don't have a growth hormone assay for the cat, and so we diagnose acromegaly by looking at uh, IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, 
and that's an assay that we uh, run through Michigan State. If it's a dog and we're worried about pancreatitis, then we may do PLI testing or CAT. TLI if we're worried about extracan pancreatic insufficiency. And then depending on what diagnosis we've ultimately made, if we're diagnosing Cushing's or acromegaly um, and we, the Cushing's is of pituitary origin, then we may talk to the owners about doing some kind of imaging to confirm, especially in a cat, uh, the presence of a pituitary mass. So we, I mentioned briefly in talking about diabetes that uh, with respect to obesity, that obesity really now is being looked more and more um, at as a disease of inflammation and the macrophage seems to be heavily involved in the cascade of things that go wrong uh, with, OD, uh, with obesity. So as we have increasing fat stores, um, that is inciting an inflammatory reaction, bringing macrophages into the fat stores releasing a variety of pro-inflammatory mediators. And these things will have an effect on muscle, uh, causing muscle insulin resistance. Really, insulin works on muscle and, and on fat. Uh, fat and insulin resistance. And then these inflammatory mediators as well will go to the liver where they're going to increase gluconeogenesis and increase the secretion of glucagon. So anything that we can do to block the effects of obesity uh, either through diet, uh, diet and weight loss, diet, weight loss, and exercise are designed to decrease the amount of these inflammatory mediators that are being produced. And it really falls into two categories when we're looking at obesity, both in animals and in people, and that are people that are normal, have a normal uh, genetic makeup, no predisposing factors to beta cell dysfunction, and then people that are susceptible to beta cell dysfunction because they have a history of diabetes. So in humans with a family history of diabetes, they would be over here. I suspect that we can put all cats over here as well uh, because all cats are basically susceptible uh, because of the, the issue with amyloidosis of their islets as they get older. So what happens in the face of the normal beta cell function and the presence of obesity Obesity results in uh, increased beta cell function and increased beta cell mass because the pancreas now has to secrete more insulin because there's more body weight, has to secrete more insulin to keep the blood sugar within a narrow range. So they can have a normal glucose tolerance, but they end up having a normal glucose tolerance at the expense of hyperinsulinism. And eventually, if the obesity is not corrected, even normal beta cell function can deteriorate. The beta cells go through what's called beta cell exhaustion. Beta cell mass decreases, and then they become glucose intolerant and develop diabetes. Versus cats and people with genetic predisposition to uh, diabetes, they have a susceptible beta cell. They become obese. They develop beta cell dysfunction, and the beta cells actually die. They undergo apoptosis, um, both in people and in the cat resulting in impaired glucose tolerance and the development of what is at least initially type 2 or non-insulin dependent diabetes, which could progress to insulin dependent diabetes if we don't address uh, the factors such as obesity and diet uh, that are driving that person and that pancreas to that level. So we talked about diet uh, with the dog basically being these high complex carbohydrate, low fat, high fiber diets. The idea is to maintain ideal body weight. You want them to lose weight if they're obese and gain weight uh, if they're too thin. To gain weight, we would probably uh, be more inclined to put them on a more calorically dense diet uh, than uh, WD because we're more concerned about uh, low body weight predisposing to ketoacidosis than obesity in that patient mm -hmm. contributing to insulin resistance. Um, we already talked about the role of uh, fiber. Um, decreasing uh, gastric emptying, playing a role in improving glucose tolerance and improving weight. And really with any of these diets, and we all know that it's really hard for people to get their pets to lose weight, even though we're telling them what food to feed, what amount to feed, um, it can be sort of a constant battle. It is important that we're at least formulating, uh, giving them some idea of how many calories uh, they should be taking in in a day. Um, looking at whatever foods they're going to be using to formulate for them the amount of food that they should be eating and trying to limit the amount of food that they're going to be eating in order to get the weight loss. And we really want the weight loss to occur gradually. There's a lot of uh, studies, especially in cats, showing that diets that result in rapid weight loss are actually worse for the cat than being obese because rapid, uh, rapid, <laughs> rapid weight loss... <laughs> 
rapid weight loss in the cat can predispose to hepatic lipidosis. So we really want the cats to lose weight uh, over a gradual period of time. And in cats with diabetes, uh, oh, we already talked about those two things, so we're not going to talk about them again. In cats with diabetes, we're really talking about switching them to these high-protein, low-carb diets, uh, diets like Purina DM, Hills MD, uh, also the metabolic diet that just came out from Hills. Um, the rules that we also use are that if they won't feed any of those diets, anything canned is better than anything dry, and we want to avoid anything that's semi-moist. So any semi-moist food, any food that's in a foil pouch uh, is bad. Uh, for a diabetic cat because they contain a lot of simple sugar. And the fructose in those simple sugar diets is rapidly absorbed across the gut. And the goal really with these foods is to mimic the diet uh, that a natural carnivore uh, would be taking in, and the cat is the best carnivore on the planet. And they're taking in less than 6% uh, of their calories as carbohydrates, so they're really not designed for carbs. And the other thing that there's been some nice studies on in cats and feeding them for both weight control and for diabetes is that, you know, the concern, especially when you're giving insulin, is do they need to be meal-fed cats? So do they have to eat two meals a day, one meal at the time of each insulin injection? Because cats, historically, they don't listen. And so, you know, they eat when they freaking feel like they want to eat. And so, you know, you go to feed the cat and the cat won't eat, it jumps off the counter, and now the owner's going, what the hell, what do I do? You know, do I give him his insulin or not? And the answer is, yeah, give it to him. Um, you know, you want to give him his insulin. And whether they eat free choice or eat meals, uh, the data so far looks like the cats that are allowed to eat uh, freely do better than cats that are being forced to be meal fed. Um, it, because, again, their metabolism is geared towards small amounts of food being taken in over the course of the day. And their metabolism is not really geared to eating two large meals a day. So free feeding the cat's actually not a bad thing uh, in terms of regulating their uh, calories. The whole thing of uh, progesterone and insulin resistance in the dog or the cat, again, in the dog we see it during pregnancy or diastrus. In the dog and in the cat we can also see it as a result of uh, unilateral adrenal tumors that are secreting progesterone or secreting 17-hydroxyprogesterone. What these result in is the progesterone itself, either during pregnancy or diastrus, has some effect on reducing the binding of insulin to the receptor, uh, reducing glucose transport. But the main thing that it does is it stimulates the release in the dog of growth hormone. And bizarrely enough, the growth hormone excess that we're seeing in dogs with progesterone is not coming from the pituitary. The growth hormone is coming from the mammary tissue. So what happens is the mammary tissue... Uh, is being produced in response to the progesterone. The uh, mammary production of growth hormone then results in basically the formation of acromegaly. And you can see there's been papers describing intact female dogs who are diabetic that actually develop features of acromegaly over time. So the growth hormone that's being secreted um, is going to cause a lot of the characteristic signs of acromegaly that we'll talk about in cats. It decreases the number of insulin receptors, decreases expression of glucose transporter genes. And the main thing with uh, an intact female dog is we want to recommend spaying them as soon as possible. Because what we know is if the first appearance of the diabetes is occurring during diastrus, there's a very good chance that if we spay the dog, the diabetes is going to be transient. However, if they don't spay the dog, every time that dog goes through another heat cycle, it's going to predispose them to becoming diabetic again. It's going to predispose the dog to DKA. And after it goes through two or three heat cycles, it's probably going to become diabetic and stay diabetic. So we really want to get them stable, uh, spay them quickly. Spaying them lowers their progesterone, drops their growth hormone concentrations, and improves the insulin resistance. Now, if we look at uh, Cushing's disease, uh, it's the most common cause of insulin resistance in the dog. Uh, 38% in one study. It's the second most common cause of insulin resistance uh, in the cat. 17% uh, of the cats, that was the identifiable cause. And what happens with uh, hypergenocorticism or exogenous glucocorticoids is that steroids antagonize insulin at the level of the insulin receptor, both in liver, muscle, and fat. Uh, decreases the number and the efficacy of the glucose transporter gene so that the pancreas no longer knows what the glucose is. Increases glucagon, uh, which increases blood sugar through gluconeogenesis, and increases the secretion of fatty acids, which uh, increases to insulin resistance. And then one of the common things that comes up in 
when you're looking at diabetic dogs with, you know, do they or do they not have concurrent Cushing's, is probably what happened is that what probably came first was the Cushing's. It was only resulting in mild symptoms of maybe some PUPD. And then since the Cushing's wasn't addressed <coughs> and the insulin resistance continued, then eventually the dogs become hyperglycemic, uh, symptomatic for diabetes. They come in and get diagnosed with diabetes first, and then we back up into the diagnosis of Cushing's later on because the dog develops insulin-resistant diabetes or because the dog develops uh, more obvious physical manifestations of the Cushing's um, as they're on insulin treatment. And things get a little bit more interesting in terms of what test you want to use to diagnose a, a diabetic Cushionoid dog. Because when we talked about the test to diagnose Cushing's, these are all certainly tests that we can use, uh, whether it's a stem test, a low-dose dex or a urine cortisol to creatinine ratio, they're all looking at uh, different aspects of the pituitary adrenal axis. But we do know that all of these tests are affected by non-adrenal illness, uh, including diabetes. And the urine cortisol to creatinine ratio is probably the, less, the least uh, accurate because virtually every disease on the planet will cause an animal to hypersecrete cortisol. So probably as a diagnostic test for Cushing's in a diabetic dog, um, probably not going to be very accurate. The test that uh, has also been shown to be affected significantly by diabetes is the DEX suppression test. So the DEX suppression test, well, we probably like that test as our initial test in a non-diabetic dog. Probably in a diabetic dog, uh, what we're going to want is to use uh, an ACTH stimulation test because the ACTH stim test in the face of diabetes has been shown to be less affected uh, by non-adrenal illness. So in normal non-diabetics, we low-dose dex them first and then stim them if we're not sure. But in a diabetic, you're probably going to want to stim them first rather than do uh, a dex suppression test. For Cushing's in cats, just because there is not as much data in terms of large case series on Cushionoid cats, um, in terms of what test you want to do, most of the time what we're doing in cats is a dexamethasone suppression test um, because it looks like the ACTH stem test is probably not as good. Um, the dose, though, for the dex suppression test in cats is different than dogs. It's actually 10 times the dose. So when we're doing a dex suppression test in a dog, it's 0.01 mg per kg. But when you're doing a dex suppression test in a cat, it's 0.1 mg per kg. And that's IV with a, a pre, a four, and an eight-hour test. And in two studies anyway, it's about 85 to 90% accurate in distinguishing a non-cushionoid from a cushionoid cat. So I would probably do that. Uh, I would do the, this form of a dex suppression test if I was trying to diagnose Cushing's in a uh, diabetic cat rather than doing a stem test. <clears throat> now the second most common cause of resistance in dogs, first was Cushing's, second most common is going to be infections. Uh, ends up being the fourth most common cause of, in, of uh, resistance in cats. In dogs, it's urinary tract being the most common, followed by skin. In cat, it's oral cavity uh, being first, followed by uh, urinary tract. So oral cavity disease in cats probably uh, contributes to insulin resistance. So if they've got bad gingivitis stomatitis, uh, we probably need to address that with something like uh, clindamycin or clavamox um, to see if we can get control. <coughs> And we're looking at, again, these don't have to be clinically nasty infections. Simple pyodermas, asymptomatic UTIs. Um, certainly, if they're symptomatic, we want to treat them. We want to eliminate any of these infections as we can because what happens with bacterial infections is that there's a host of things that go on that predispose to infections if you're a diabetic. Um, it's been shown in dogs, cats, and people that Diabetics have decreased blood supply, they have decreased capillary flow, uh, which predisposes at least people to uh, small vessel disease. So this is the reason why they have a lot of problems with uh, thrombosis of their extremities and amputation. Diabetes impairs both humoral immunity and cell-mediated immunity. Uh, so diabetics are really immunocompromised relative to non-diabetics. And there is decreased uh, phagocytic activity in diabetics as well. So being a diabetic predisposes to infection and getting an infection predisposes to insulin resistance. And a lot of these things, again, are mediated uh, through the macrophage, sort of like what we saw with obesity. 
is that the lipopolysaccharide of the bacteria, uh, similar to free fatty acids, stimulate a cascade of signaling mechanisms, primarily through tyrosine kinases, that result in release of inflammatory mediators from the macrophage, which then go up and bind to receptors on fat cells, which result in, again, another tyrosine kinase being activated that blocks the effects of insulin. So getting rid of the infection improves <coughs> insulin resistance through multiple mechanisms involving not just the fat cell, but also uh, the mechanisms involved in, uh, in macrophages. Now, a common concurrent disease in cats with diabetes is renal disease. And renal disease can result in problems with insulin and problems with diabetes because one of the things that happens in dogs and cats is that anywhere from 20 to 40% of insulin is actually metabolized, not in the liver, but by the renal tubular cells. And so if you have decreased clearance of insulin or decreased metabolism of the insulin, you can have very erratic blood levels uh, of insulin, which can result in poor glycemic control. So decreased clearance, uh, decreased renal glucose production, and increased insulin sensitivity because it's hanging around longer all contribute to erratic control. So with a diabetic cat that's also azotemic, you're probably going to notice not as good a control as you would get in a non-azotemic cat unless we can get renal function fairly stable. Um, with stable renal function by dealing with uh, diet, dealing with sub-Q fluids, whatever other things you're using to uh, slow down the progression of renal disease, if we can get things to be relatively stable, then hopefully glycemic control and insulin dose will remain relatively constant. If we look at the kidney, you won't be able to look at that slide, but if we look at all of the things that are going on inside of the kidney um, and looking at being a diabetic, sometimes we have to ask the question, well, what's the worst disease for the cat? The chronic renal disease with progression of renal insufficiency or the diabetes? Because what we can run into is what are we going to do about food? Um, because ideally a diabetic cat we want on high protein, low carb, probably don't really want a very high protein diet uh, in an azotemic cat uh, because of the effects on progression of renal disease and uh, phosphorus levels. So I'll show you some data later on this afternoon when we talk about hyperthyroidism in cats, looking at diets that um, can be helpful not only to deal with the hyperthyroid state, but also deal with the issue of azotemia and lean body mass uh, in geriatric cats because Geriatric cats, uh, part of the weight loss that occurs in geriatric cats who are not sick is related to protein malnutrition. So we'll talk about uh, ways that we can try and manage that uh, with dietary treatment. Chronic pancreatitis is also a, a potential problem of insulin resistance, and oftentimes this is subclinical. So a really nice study out of Davis showed that 35% of diabetic dogs, 50% of diabetic cats had histologic evidence of pancreatitis at the time of necropsy. Now, it's always difficult to tell what that means in terms of what that necropsy finding meant with respect to the clinical picture that was going on, but the fact that there is a chronic inflammatory disease going on at the same time would make sense that glycemic control might be poor, that hyperglycemia may be more persistent, that insulin dose might be erratic because there may be times when their own pancreas is producing more or less insulin, and it may contribute to the, to the animal just not feeling well, especially if they're becoming uh, symptomatic for the pancreatitis. So this is one of the reasons why we may screen dogs and cats uh, with PLI testing. <clears throat> Fortunately, concurrent EPI and diabetes is very rare, uh, especially in cats. EPI is just rare in cats, period. Um, where we do see uh, diabetes and EPI together is in uh, breeds that are born with pancreatic atrophy. This is usually the German Shepherd that presents with chronic diarrhea uh, from the time of being a puppy. Um, these are really difficult patients to manage, uh, not so much from the EPI standpoint, from, but from the combination of being diabetic and EPI uh, because there's constant changes going on with body weight and protein and fat uh, distribution. And it can also occur as a result of chronic pancreatitis um, especially in breeds uh, like schnauzers. So while most schnauzers don't go on to develop EPI, a lot of schnauzers, as we saw earlier, um, they're at a risk for diabetes. And so it can be that the chronic pancreatitis initially leads to loss of beta cell function, which results in them becoming diabetic. 
Now, hypothyroidism is the fourth most common cause of resistance in dogs, which is a little bit surprising, uh, at least based on the, how common it is. But hypothyroidism can play a role because if you look, you know, thyroid hormone basically regulates metabolic rate. And so what we see is that with hypothyroidism in dogs and hypothyroidism in people is that one factor is obesity, simply gaining weight causes resistance, hypertriglyceridemia causes resistance, but there's really primarily a primary defect in glucose transport into the cell uh, in the face of insulin that results in the insulin resistance. And in one paper, hypothyroid dogs who were uh, treated with thyroid supplementation, the insulin requirement decreased by 50 to 60% within the first two weeks. And so what we usually recommend doing is that if you have a dog who's diabetic, who's resistant, and you diagnose hypothyroidism and you supplement them, we just cut their insulin dose by 50% on day one. Uh, because what we're trying to prevent is a hypoglycemic reaction and we'd rather that they run a little bit high for the next couple of weeks uh, than run a little bit low. And you know, we'll talk more about uh, thyroid function testing if, if you're here this afternoon, but basically the problem with diagnosing hypothyroidism in a diabetic is the problem that non-thyroidal illness can adversely affect the measurement of total T4. And that can happen uh, certainly with diabetes, Certainly, depending on your laboratory, if your resting total T4 is greater than one and a half, you've pretty much ruled it out. But conversely, a total T4 of 1.5 or less does not confirm a diagnosis of hypothyroidism because uh, systemic illness or medications can result in uh, issues related to uh, uh, hypothyroidism and, and insulin resistance. So we'll skip that for a second, just talk about free T4. The way that we get around this um, issue in dogs with hypothyroidism and diabetes is not to look at total, but to look at free. And the reason we look at free is that free T4 is not protein bound. It's not uh, bound to any circulating proteins. It's not affected by medications. It's less affected by disease. And we know that there's a linear correlation between the concentration of free T4 in the blood and the metabolic rate, which makes sense. And we also know that the concentration of free T4 in the blood is inversely correlated with the log of the concentration of TSH, which means a small drop in free T4 causes a pronounced rise uh, in TSH levels. So what your pituitary is really listening to is free T4, it's not listening to total. And when we look at the accuracy of free T4 testing in diagnosing hypothyroidism, the sensitivity and specificity and overall accuracy are actually very good. So I think it's okay to screen with total, but if your total T4 is less than one and a half, before I would make a diagnosis of hypothyroidism in a diabetic, it probably would be reasonable to go ahead and add on uh, a free T4 by dialysis. In people, what they would hope to do is to measure your TSH. Um, that's the way that you get your thyroid check. The problem is, is that the TSH assays that we have right now in dogs, 25% uh, of confirmed hypothyroid dogs don't have a high TSH, they have a normal one. And that's because the assay that we currently use in dogs is simply not sensitive enough. We don't have a sufficient assay or sufficient antibody to pick up uh, a small rise in all of the different forms of TSH that are in the blood. So using TSH by itself is not very helpful. Uh, putting it in combination uh, or if we look at it as a standalone test, the problem is the sensitivity is only 76%, uh, so it's not a good screening test. And even when we combine TSH with free T4, what you see is the overall accuracy is actually less than free T4 by itself because of the problem with uh, TSH is not being high in all hypothyroid dogs. So I think at the end of the day, we still look at what is the free T4 to tell us is the dog hypothyroid and doesn't need uh, supplementation. Can you look at thyroid function in sick dogs? The answer is really no. So if you have a vomiting, diarrhea, pancreatitis dog, you can just forget about his thyroid for now because even free T4 and TSHs can be adversely affected. So you need to just get them through whatever their illness is. And when you get them through that illness, if you still think they're hypothyroid, then bring them back. Uh, and start looking at uh, total T4 and free T4 testing. Insulin resistance occurs uh, as a result of cancer in 5 to 10% of dogs uh, with insulin resistance. 
The most common tumors in dogs where this has been reported are pheos and glucagon secreting tumors. Uh, pheochromocytomas, because they're secreting catecholamines, uh, results in increased hepatic gluconeogenesis. Lymphomas and mast cell tumors, uh, while they're the most common causes, it's not 100% clear what the mast cell neoplasia is doing. Lymphoma, this is probably the body's response to the lymphoma um, with a lot of increased production of inflammatory mediators that are resulting in insulin resistance. So, you know, when we get to this point of screening for tumors, this is when we're looking at uh, taking radiographs and doing ultrasound to find something that's fairly occult. Elevated triglycerides, especially in breeds that have primary hypertriglyceridemia, especially schnauzers, have difficulty uh, in, we have difficulty in treating their diabetes because the hypertriglyceridemia is a primary event unrelated to the diabetes. Even when we treat the diabetes, the hypertriglyceridemia persists, and the high levels of triglyceride in the blood have multiple effects on either insulin or the insulin receptor, uh, increasing hepatic gluconeogenesis, uh, down-regulating insulin receptors, so even though they're present, they're not active. And so one of the things we have to do is, especially in breeds like schnauzers, is get them on insulin, try and control their sugars, and if they're still hypertriglyceridemic, then through diet and or diet medication, see if we can get their lipid levels down. Because if we can't get their lipid levels down, we're going to end up having to use much higher doses. And where we're primarily looking is that most diabetics, uh, straight-up diabetics, are going to have serum triglycerides that are less than 500. But if you have a patient where the triglyceride levels are greater than 800, you're probably dealing with an animal that has concurrent pancreatitis or a primary hyperlipidemic disorder that's going to require investigation. So the ones that are less than 500 are probably going to resolve with insulin therapy, um, but the ones that are greater than 800 probably have an underlying disorder, pancreatitis or hypothyroidism or a primary hyperlipidemia uh, that we're going to have to come back and address. Now, the, the number one cause of insulin resistance now in cats is acromegaly. We used to think that this was a very uncommon disease in cats because we only look for acromegaly in the cats that looked acromegalic, in the cats that had... Um, clinical signs of acromegaly, which is basically going to be uh, large cats. Uh, they're going to have large heads, a lot of tongue, a lot of arthritis. They're going to have heart murmurs and cardiomyopathy. They're going to have weird dentition because their teeth are going to start to spread apart uh, from soft tissue growth. They develop diabetes, um, and then they can develop um, things like congestive heart failure as a result of cardiomyopathy. So there's been sort of a suspicion that acromegaly is actually more common in the cat population than we thought it was. And um, they did a really nice study where they looked at 184 cats with uh, less than ideally controlled diabetes. None of these cats had clinical features that would make the clinicians actually order an IGF-1 test to screen the cat for acromegaly. And what they found was that 32% of these cats, 59 cats, had markedly elevated IGF-1 concentrations. And in 18 of those cats where the owners allowed imaging, of those 18 cats, 17 of the cats had a big pituitary tumor on imaging. And that's been our experience, is that whenever we have a cat that's having poor glycemic control, insulin resistant, we've ruled out it's not an owner management problem, the first thing that we do is screen them for acromegaly. And if their IGF-1 is high, then the next thing we do is talk to the owner about getting the cat image because every single cat that's been reported and every single cat that we've seen with acromegaly has a very large mass uh, in their pituitary. So this is a cat, this is Loki. Uh, it was a 14-year-old uh, male castrate uh, domestic short hair cat. Uh, this cat uh, lived in Seattle. Um, the cat was uh, unique for two reasons. One, it was a hell cat. It was like the world's meanest cat as well, uh, both to the owners and to veterinarians. And this cat had become diabetic about six months prior to presentation. And what they had done is they had been doing the, the right protocol, doing the intensive protocol at home, switching the cat's food. They were able to get glucose from this cat or blood sugars from this cat. And they had noticed that their insulin dose had gone from 2 to 15 units twice a day. At 15 units twice a day, they got control of the hyperglycemia. The cat's fructosamine came down, the blood sugar uh, curve looked pretty good, but this cat still had crazy bad uh, PUPD. 
So I talked, um, we were talking to the veterinarian up there and said, you know, let's go ahead and screen the cat for the common stuff. So we had blood work, uh, a chem panel, a total T4, which is normal, UA and a UMIC, uh, UMIC was negative, thoracic rads were normal, sent a serum IGF-1 to Michigan State, came back greater than 560, but that's high, because um, 92 is the upper limit and normal. Greater than 560 means they got bored. Um, and they didn't want to dilute the serum out anymore, so they said it was, it was high. Uh, the cat went into a magnet at a referral hospital in Seattle, and the cat had this. So this is a very large pituitary mass uh, in the cat. This is an area here of hemorrhage within the pituitary. Um, a normal pituitary in a cat would be about the size of that dot. Um, so fairly large tumor. Um, this is the cat's tumor on coronal section. These are the optic nerves coming back here. Uh, again, fairly large lump. And this was a cat who was clinically normal, neurologically normal. And this is the cat's uh, sagittal sections. This is where the cella would sit. Again, the tumor would maybe, be, or normal pituitary would be about right there. And this is all extensive tumor growing up uh, and into the third ventricle of that cat. So what we did with this cat is we did surgery on this cat uh, to remove the tumor. Um, again, we're doing a transfunoidal approach with an endoscope uh, going through the mouth of the cat. And in the cat, the nice thing is, uh, in cats, when we're doing this surgery, is that where we're going is we go in, this is the hard palate, soft palate. Uh, we're going in through the base of sphenoid bone right here. And this is the sphenoid sinus. Uh, dogs don't have one of these, but cats have a really large sphenoid sinus, as do humans. And so the nice thing is we can go uh, through the base of sphenoid bone into the sphenoid sinus, open up the sphenoid sinus wall, and, and extract the tumor that way uh, through the cat's oral mouth. So this cat underwent transphenoidal surgery. Uh, four weeks later, uh, the cat was off all insulin. Uh, so he went from 15 units BID to no insulin. Eight weeks after surgery, we took him off all uh, hormonal treatment. He was off of thyroid hormone replacement and off of glucocorticoid replacement. He had an MRI and IGF-1 uh, six and 12 months later, and they were normal. Uh, no pituitary tumor, and his IGF-1s uh, normalized. Now, one of the things that's a little bit different about um, this is that in, whoop, in the past, with acromegaly in cats, we've done primarily radiation treatment on cats with uh, acromegaly because no one was doing surgery. And what we see is that you can get some reduction in IGF-1, you get some improvement in glycemic control and a lowering of insulin dose, but we're not getting rid of the tumor completely. And a lot of those cats uh, die of cardiomyopathy because their IGF-1 stay elevated, they continue to get cardiac enlargement, uh, and then they continue to progress uh, in their HCM. So what we're interested in in cats is why is it so common in cats? Why are, is acromegaly such a common disorder in the cats? Um, so similar to what we've been doing in dogs, as we take the tumor tissue out, looking at what receptors are being overexpressed, primarily so we can look at uh, would somatostatin analogs um, work like the posterioride that we're looking at in dogs, would growth hormone receptor antagonists that are used to treat acromegaly in people uh, work in the cat, because uh, we're not sure that they would bind to the same receptors uh, as happen in humans. And with dopaminergic therapy, which works fairly well in people because dopamine inhibits growth hormone uh, release in people, would dopaminergic drugs work to either control IGF-1 concentrations or decrease tumor size and control IGF-1 concentrations uh, in cats? So uh, we do offer uh, surgery in cats if you have an acromegalic cat and you scan it and it's got a big tumor. Uh, we'd be happy to cut that thing out of there if they don't want to do radiation. So. In closing, this insulin resistance, the most common complication of insulin therapy that we see, most of the time we can figure out what's causing the resistance first by removing uh, anything that's related to insulin treatment or owner management. Uh, so we'll go through the diagnostic workup. Most of these have a good clinical outcome with respect to a lot of these are reversible things, and it's fun uh, to work them up. I mean, diabetes is a good disease, insulin resistance is a good disease. And so since we treat disease, it's, it's fun today. All right, does anybody have any questions on anything insulin resistance related? Anything that you see? How many, how many people have diagnosed an acromegalic cat? Yeah, so that's your goal, is to go back. And I want you to email me 
because you're all going to diagnose an acromegalic cat in the next six months. And the only reason that you're not diagnosing them is because you're not sending Michigan blood. So send blood to Michigan. All right, have a good lunch. Oh,